of the thousands and thousands of exoplanets discovered so far, TRESS 2b is the darkest one we've discovered so far. Now in this video we're going to have a look at the planet itself, how it was detected, and why it's the darkest planet out of all of those thousands of planets we've found so far. So to put it into context of a planet we're more familiar with, it's fairly similar in size to Jupiter and mass. So size-wise it's about 1.27 times the radius of Jupiter, and about 1.2 times the mass, so a little bit bigger than Jupiter. But there are greater differences there when we look at other things. So for example, it orbits its star in just under 2.5 days. That is a very short orbital period, which means it's very close to its star. Now for context, Jupiter orbits in over 4,000 days. So Jupiter is much further out. And because of that, we would classify this as a hot Jupiter because it's very close to its star. It's about the size of Jupiter, so it's a Jupiter-sized planet, but it's also very hot. Now, again, to put that into context of our own solar system, Mercury is our closest planet to the, to the Sun, and this planet orbits less than one-tenth the orbital radius of Mercury. So Mercury is quite hot, it's very close to our star, but it's one-tenth the distance to its Sun compared to Mercury. So again, this just highlights how hot it's going to be and how close it is to its star. So, because it's so close, it's expected to be tidally locked. So when planets get very close to their star, the strong tides from the star actually slow its rotation down to the point where the same face is always facing towards the star as it goes around. So one rotation of the planet equals one orbital period. So you're always going to have a day side and a night side. Now that has consequences for its temperature. Now because it's very close it's obviously going to be very hot. Now its temperature is just under 2000 Kelvin and I've put the temperature of the Sun and a fairly typical red dwarf star which is a fairly small star. So a red dwarf star could be 3000 Kelvin you know plus or minus a little bit. So this planet is only just slightly cooler I suppose than a red dwarf. Now that temperature there that's given is like its, e its equilibrium temperature, that's its kind of average temperature across the whole object and because it's tidally locked it's going to have quite, uh, it's going to have a contrast between the temperature on the day side and the night side. So it's going to be in excess of 2000 Kelvin on the day side and cooler on the night side. So again this highlights how hot it is and it's approaching the sort of temperature you might get on the surface of a small or a reddish star. So actually even a red giant star would have a cool surface temperature. But when we compare the star that it orbits, so TRESS-2 is the actual star that it's orbiting, it's almost identical to the Sun. So it has the, almost the same radius, same mass, same temperature, give or take a little bit. So it's almost the same as the Sun. So we can think of it as a Sun-like star. Now, how was it first detected? Well, it was detected with the transit method, and it was first observed with SLUF and the Planet Search Survey Telescope, and it blocked out some of the light from the star. And on the right-hand side, you can see that dip in brightness as it blocks out some of that light. Now, that is various different telescopes and various different filters, so in different colours, essentially. But they all give that characteristic dip in brightness as the planet passes in front. Now that can give you the size of the planet, the radius. But in order to get things like the mass, there has been other techniques that have been used. So for example, the radial velocity method, which is where you would measure the Doppler shift of the star, can give us the mass. So we can't actually measure the velocity of the planet because we can't detect that, but we can measure the light from the star. And they both orbit a common centre of mass, but because the star is so much bigger, the centre of mass is closer to the star, so it kind of wobbles a little bit. And if we measure the Doppler effect, or the Doppler shift of light from that star, it will move away from us and towards us, and we can measure that. So if it's tra travelling towards us, the star, the light from the star will be slightly blue shifted, it will become slightly bluer. And if it moves away from us, it becomes slightly redder or red shifted. Now when we create a plot of that, because we can get the velocity directly using the Doppler shift, we can get a plot like this. And this was measured using the, one of the Keck telescopes. And you can see they've got, you've got that nice kind of sine wave 
of that radial velocity <clears throat> against time. And that can give us the orbital period of the planet, but also the mass as well, because the bigger the planet, the bigger the radial velocity you're going to get. But remember, that is from the star. So it's been confirmed with a few different methods there. Now, let's go back to the darkness of the planet. Now, that star is emitting light, which is then going to the planet, and that planet is then reflecting some of that light back again, which is how we can see planets. But it's only reflecting, well, it's reflecting less than 1% of the starlight that actually hits it. So the vast majority of that light falling on the planet is absorbed by it. It's not emitted again. Now, how do we know that, and how has that actually been measured? Well, for, before we do that, just to put that into context, that is darker than coal or black paint. So coal and black paint absorb a lot of the light that falls on it and they don't reflect a lot of it out. And this planet is actually reflecting less light than you'd expect for coal or some black paint. <clears throat> so how is it actually detected? Well, if we are looking from the blue arrow, so viewing from Earth, that planet goes around the star. So at some points it will be in front or behind. And when it's behind, the planet is actually reflecting some additional light. So we can only really measure the light from the star, how bright that star is. But if, it, if the planet contributes a little bit extra, the star will appear slightly brighter. So when it's behind that star, we get a little bit extra. And if you look at the light curve or the light from the star against time, you get a bit of a hump when that planet is behind the star and it's emitting that extra light. So it's the planet light plus the starlight, which means it's a little bit extra than before. Now, when that planet is in front of the star, it's not reflecting any additional light. So we lose that. So therefore, you're, the star appears slightly dimmer. Now, if it's a large planet as well, you get a secondary eclipse where that planet passes in front of the, or sorry, not in front, in behind the star. And because of that, the contribution from the planet is missing. So then you're only getting the starlight. So you get that secondary dip during the orbit. So what you can do then is if you already know the size of the planet and you measure how much light is being reflected by the planet, additional light, then you can work out its ref reflectance or the albedo. And that is how much light is reflected from an object. And for example, something like the Earth, when it was during an ice age, is going to reflect a lot of light. It's going to have a very high albedo. So an object or planet like this one, with which is very, very dark, is going to have a very low albedo. So it's reflecting a lot less light. Now, why is it so dark? Well, it could have a lack of reflective clouds in its atmosphere. So again, like the, like the Earth, if we have these clouds in our atmosphere. They actually reflect light back out. So it increases your albedo. Again, if you have a frozen surface, that will increase your albedo as well. So a lack of reflective clouds is one source that may make it so dark. But because it's so hot, there is expected to be a lot of light absorbing chemicals in its atmosphere. So things like vaporized sodium, potassium or gaseous titanium oxide actually absorb the light. And because it's so hot, you have these in the atmosphere, which you wouldn't expect to find in other sorts of planets. So it's thought that hot Jupiters in general are going to be quite dark. But this particular one is the darkest one found so far. Thank you for watching. And if you enjoy, then check out some of the other videos.